in a rock is Jesus going to build his church on? That's what we'll find out in Matthew 16. All right. So this ministry of Jesus is starting to gel. We have our disciples. They've been given their mission. And now in chapter 16, the Pharisees and Sadducees come to test him. Last time we saw that the Pharisees from Jerusalem came. So these aren't going to be their local Pharisees. These are going to be the bigger wigs. And now the Sadducees are with them. And isn't it funny how you get two competing points of view that would typically hate each other, but they unify on both disliking Jesus. So they both show up together, working together in order to twist Jesus up into some kind of plot. So they come to him and they ask for a sign, which my first thought for that was like, have you not been watching? hearing all the things he's been doing, and now you want another sign? <laughs> and that's where Jesus says, you who have eyes see and you have ears hear. Look, listen. And I say, well, it'd be nice if you had a sign. There used to be this Steve Martin movie, and he asks for a sign if he should marry this woman. And the whole house shakes and a giant voice booms, no. And he goes, okay, well, I don't hear anything, so it must be a yes. People ignore signs that are right in front of them and yet ask for one. And he says to them back, you look to weather. I'm a, I'm a weather nerd, too, by the way. You look to the weather. And when you see the sky is red and you see the sky is threatening, you forecast the weather. And yet you cannot even forecast the signs of the time. You're looking to the weather for signs. You're not looking at to what is actually happening. And these are supposed to be religious scholars, so they should be the first people who look for signs. And he said, the only sign you're going to get is a sign of Jonah, which again is referring to him being in the grave for three days and three nights and coming back and causing repentance. Then he warns his disciples who left all the bread that they just created for the crowd behind. He says, watch out for the leaven, the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so the disciples were like, what? We didn't even bring any bread. Why are you yelling at us about bread? They're saying this to themselves. But of course, Jesus knows everything that they're talking about. And he says, oh, why are you talking about bread? Do you not remember? I create bread. So this is not about food because I can make food anytime I want. You just don't even understand what I'm talking about. I am talking about the leavening, the poisoning of the Pharisees and the Sadducees growing. Like we're going to grow in the kingdom of God in his example of leaven. Likewise, the Pharisees can also grow in that way. And then they got it. Oh, you're not talking about bread. Gotcha. Sometimes they can be rather dense for the called servants of God. Isn't that kind of interesting? They go to another district, which is way north and not part of the traditional land of Israel, but was part of Herod the Great's land. And his son, Philip, expanded this area. And so he called it Caesarea Philippi. So he's honoring Caesar, but also saying, you know, I made this thing even better than before. So he, they're walking through this area and I watched this video about what this place looks like. You know, I wasn't familiar with this place. And so what it was, was heavily Greek back when the Greeks lived there. And so it's an area that's called Panios and it was named for the god Pan and his wood nymph mother. So this is very much a nature god. And this place used to be different back in Bible times. It had something that was called the Gates of Hades or Hades itself. And it was a cave that had a spring bubbling up from it. And people used to throw sacrifices, namely babies, into this cave. And water then came forth from this cave. And a big earthquake changed the location of that natural spring. And so now it's somewhere else. Now it looks really desolate, dried out. It looks a lot like the wilderness in Israel. And so they're walking through this particular area. Of course, we don't know exactly where they were walking, but you can imagine that they were near these temple areas. You could see ruins of temples that were there. And they had these like indented areas where little God statues would stand, who, who they worship. And so when you have a statue of a Greek God like that, and they're walking through this area and then also walking to this place where sacrifices were given to other gods. We don't know, like I said, exactly where they were, but you could tell that this is probably weighing on everyone's minds about these dead gods. 
And Jesus says to his disciples, who do people say the son of man is, the Messiah? Well, you know, some people think it's John the Baptist and others say it's Elijah, still waiting for Elijah or Jeremiah. He was the, pro- the crime prophet that we're going to talk about someday or one of the other prophets. And so he says, well, then who do you say I am? And of course, Simon Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's an ESV. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Bar means son of. So his father was named Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, meaning it didn't come from you, but instead my father who is in heaven. Our faith comes from the Holy Spirit. So he got this the same way we get this. You hear the gospel, the Holy Spirit and the father works inside of you. So Peter understands this message just like we understand this message. Then he kind of gives a bit of a wordplay. A lot of different interpretations will come about this. I'll talk about this. He says, you are Peter, which Petra means stone. On this rock, I will build this church. And the word he uses is more like a giant rock cliff. You know, again, they were in this very rocky, desolate area. And so on this rock, I will build my church, this gigantic boulder. I tell you, little stone, that on this giant rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell, which are not the gates of hell in this cave, but instead hell is death. And death will not overcome this kingdom. So let's just talk about that initially. So he is saying he's maybe the very first person who fully understands who Jesus is, the first member of the church, the first member who is going to be a part of this. He's going to be a stone as part of a giant rock. Peter is just a little tiny part of this gigantic thing Jesus is about to build. And it's going to be built on rock, which we learned a few chapters ago that when you build something on a rock, it will withstand the storms because you have a great foundation. So we know how this church is already going to get started. Then he says something curious, and this is the part that took a lot of research. I have heard this phrase for years and never, I think, fully understood what it meant. But I will give you the keys to the kingdom, and whatever you bind shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then he told his disciples, you know, don't talk about this, not ready yet. So what are the keys to the kingdom? And there are a lot of views, just like there are views of Peter. You know, was Peter the first pope? Was Peter the first church member? Or there are going to be more stones like you that will make up this massive rock. Just like the idea of Peter, this idea of the keys of the kingdom is very challenging to understand. Part of this has to do with what rabbis were doing. Rabbis were given this ability to bind and loose. It was something that would have been familiar to them. And the idea behind it is that they would hold something or not hold something to a specific point. If we came to a rabbi and said, Rabbi, is it okay if Jill reads a book on Sabbath, they would come up with a determination whether to bind it and say, yes, it is, or loose it and say, no, it's not. Basically to set more minor rules. Many people, and how I've heard it also explained, is that this is giving the church the ability to forgive and giving the church the ability to condemn and say, you are not in part of the kingdom of God. I believe that is not that because Jesus has met the Pharisees and the Sadducees and people who are using the temple to destroy other people. I don't think he would reestablish that same thing again. That's just my opinion of it. And when I looked at many of the commentaries, someday I'll do a Small Steps with God uh, podcast about commentaries. It seems like most people are saying that these are more minor rules, that they will be able to form a church, construct what it's going to be made of, that this term comes from. When you have a book, you either bind it together or you loose it, which means you take out pages and separate it. And that's where the term comes from. This is more about smaller rules. Makes me think in the future when they argue about whether or not Christians have to get circumcised or whether Christians can eat meat from sacrificed animals. Those are more minor issues, and they had discussions about it and talked about what they should do. I think this got used very poorly in the past because let's say that you are an individual standing up for God and you're watching your king do something very ungodly. So the king would go get the cardinal and two or three people, and they would come to your house and try to get you to repent. And then when you didn't, they either banished you from the church, maybe burned you at the cross. 
this power of the keys of the kingdom, just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees misused it, could be u- misused by us too. So I think this is another good thing to share with your pastor and get some ideas about. That was my takeaway from it. Jesus talks to them about how he's going to have to go to Jerusalem. He's going to suffer at the hands of the elders, the priests, he says, the scribes, and then he will be killed and on the third day raised. First of all, the thing that blew me away about this is how many times Jesus has pointed in this direction. How many times have we heard this is what's going to happen? And yet, when he is killed, they're depressed. They're wigged out on that Saturday. They lost their Lord. Yet he kept telling them, this is what's going to happen. And then Peter says, because remember, Peter is impetuous. He goes and says, no, this will not happen. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance because you're not thinking about God things. You're thinking about people things. And again, when I read the commentaries about this, there were a couple different opinions. One, Jesus was sensing the presence of Satan in the room with Peter, getting him to say these things. Two, he was sensing that Peter was being a spokesperson for what Satan wanted to say. Because again, if this does not happen, there is no death on the cross. That means there's no forgiveness of sins for all of humanity. That means we are forever going to be on this earth and separated from God. This has to happen. He is not thinking about the God things. Either way, I thought the most interesting point I read in the commentaries, when he says, get behind me, Satan, because I mean, if I was in a room with Satan, I would want to have him in front of me so I could keep my eyeballs on him. But what Jesus is saying is you're the disciple. Get behind me. Follow my lead. Follow me. You are not greater than your rabbi, than your Lord. And I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. And then he tells them that if anyone comes after him, denies himself, which does not mean that you're denying who you are. It doesn't mean that you're in a state of denial about who you are. It reminds me of the phrase when people talk about God does not want us to think less of ourselves. He wants us to think about ourselves less. When we deny ourselves, that means we are ourselves. We are our gifts and our talents, but we are denying the human bodily earthly things that we crave the most. And then he says, take up the cross and follow him. Again, who did not see this coming with the cross? He says it a number of times. So it's very obvious what's going to happen next. And then he goes up to the next part, which is the opposite of the parable of the pearl or the treasure found in land. He says, What does it profit a man if he gains everything? He gets everything he wants. He gains the whole world and yet loses his soul. You have nothing. It's the opposite of those two parables where you take everything you have, sell it so that you can buy the most valuable thing. But he says, whoever saves his life will lose it. Meaning you do something, reminds me of what Peter's about to do in denying Jesus, but you try to save your life by squirming out of something. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Every single one of the apostles, except for John, who is exiled on Patmos, will do this. This is in their future. He is telling them. It must have made him sad because he knows what's coming. And then he says, the son of man is going to come with his angels in glory of his father and repay each according to what he has done. And then he says, truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who won't taste death until they see the Son of Man coming into his kingdom. What's that mean? That's, we're going to see that when Jesus comes back. We're going to talk about Jesus coming into his kingdom. So my prayer for this time has to do with thinking about the things of man. Peter, of course, if we had the Messiah here with us, no, we will not let this happen. We will defend you. We will not let them take you. Let's not go to Jerusalem. Let's go to someplace nicer. Thinking about the things of man, how many times when we see things happen that we are thinking of the things of man? And that's really what struck me about this. I have to figure out how to keep my eyes on the things of God. So, my prayer for this particular chapter is I think not being so literal. I am a really literal person. If I had heard Jesus talking about leavening and bread, I would have said, Well, why are we talking about bread? You can, you know, I would have not gotten it 
And so part of me thinks, I have to listen harder to God and not just hear how I think my brain is wired to hear things, which is literally, which is exactly what is being said, but think deeper about those things. And what I'd like to share is this time with my pastor to talk about what are the keys of the kingdom. I feel now I have a better understanding of it. It feels to me not quite what the church throughout the centuries has called it, where they can condemn people, kick people out of the church, remove people, and think that they are denying people heaven. That is for God alone. But instead, it is about running the church and running the rules within the church. But I still think I could learn more about that. So that's what I'm going to share this time. That's a good question. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate listening to the podcast. Please note that I am shortening the length of these podcasts, and I'm going to go back and shorten the first 13 of them as well, just because I think future people listening to this podcast will not want to hear about my website problems. Secondly, I found myself, like I said last week, repeating myself, and here I'm repeating myself again about last week. But just so if you see some different links on the podcast, and that's why. And please tell a friend. Also, if you know someone listening to this podcast, in some rare cases, this podcast broke in some podcatcher apps when the feed got switched to the thebibleinsmallsteps.com, which is my website. So if someone is not getting this podcast, please let them know that they can find it by deleting the podcast in their app and then re-adding it again, and then it'll hook up to the new feed. So if it suddenly stopped for people, please let them know. And let your friends know about this podcast. The goal is that if we can build a thriving community to talk about the word of God, I would really love that. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week.